then you have gotten the link to the documents and some photographs. If, you, if we don't have your email, please give it to me and I'll give you the photographs. I'm going to make sure they do a link check before we start talking. I'm going to explain what's going on. Okay, today. then let's move the microphones your way. That way we can hear if you want to do that. Or I can do it. Or you guys can. No, we can do that. Yeah. This won't, this won't take long. And then we'll put it back. Just so we can hear you properly. Right. We do need this too. Yes. Good morning, everybody. Uh, we are here to talk about a new development in the children's case. My name is Karen Kohler. I'm the lead attorney on the class action case, along with my partner Brad, behind you. Uh, also here is a family of a child that is in children's currently fighting for her life, and their attorney. I'm going to let everyone introduce themselves. Uh, Uh, after I speak. So, uh, from a procedural standpoint, the case was filed. Um, it was amended once, and that added a fifth plaintiff, and it also asked for injunctive relief, meaning we're asking the court to prevent children from allowing aspergillus to exist due to uh, lax maintenance and improper uh, air handling protocol in that building. We are now asking the court to allow us to add a sixth plaintiff in the class. And these are class representatives. We represent more than six plaintiffs, but these are class representatives. And they're representative of um, categories of, of times and categories of patients uh, in this case. The reason that we're asking to add the Hutt family, again, who you'll be introduced to, is that their baby was born and admitted and operated on in children's the most recently. And not only the most recently, but the operations occurred after children started closing operating rooms and then opening them and telling the public that it was very safe and then closing them again. So the operations that occurred here occurred in that window of time uh, right before the CEO called his press conference. The last surgery was November 7th. She actually just had on January 2nd as well. Well, about, I mean, before the diagnosis of aspergillus, uh, which was mere days before the uh, operating rooms were closed again. So I'm going to have the uh, attorney for the Huts, who's also co counsel in this case, Scott Karnas, introduce himself. And then we'll uh, open it up. We'll have you, um, well, I'm going to have Scott introduce the Huts. Um, they're longtime uh, friends of his. And I'll have him introduce them. And then we'll take questions. And with respect to the questions, I will stop if there are questions that cannot be answered by the family. And we are, they are very open to talking about their daughter their experiences, um, the how Children's is trying to take care of them while they're having to stay there as their daughter, who's basically lived her entire life in the hospital, how she's doing. Um, we don't, and we will not expect them to answer questions about the, the lawsuit and the status of the lawsuit and uh, how this happened uh, procedurally. And I'll, I'll stop if we get in that area, but they are very open to actually discussing what happened here. So I'm going to have Scott uh, introduce them to you. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. Thank you for coming today. Uh, my name is Scott Karnas. I'm an attorney at practice in, practice in Edmonds. And I'm here representing my clients, Katie and Micah Hutt, in this uh, sad, tragic situation. And um, Katie and Micah wanted to come and see you all this morning um, because they know that beyond their own loss that this is also about our community. And they know that Children's for Decades has been a beacon of hope in our community. And 
This family deserves answers. And our community deserves answers. And with that, I'd like to introduce you to Katie and Michael Hutt. Hello, everybody. Thank you guys, Ken. Instead of looking at the three of us, look at those kind of those ladies over there. Okay. They want to look hot. Okay. okay. <laughs> found out about our daughter having a, a heart issue, a general heart issue, um, last spring or earlier. Do you want me to take it? Why don't you take it? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, so at my 20 week ultrasound, we found out our baby had a heart defect that would require surgery pretty much immediately upon birth. Um, we did some research and we have children in our backyard. We were super lucky. We looked up all the different you know, ratings, and it was a, a no-brainer to, to take her to Children's. Um, when she was born, she was born at Tacoma General, and then she transferred to Seattle Children's about 24 hours after she was born. Um, her first surgery took place at five days old, and then it kind of just went from there. When she had her first surgery, had you heard about some of the ongoing concerns that children We had, had yeah. We've been following the news while I was pregnant. Um, I actually knew some people that were directly affected by having the operating rooms closed. Um, we even joked that, you know, the best place to eat is some place that just recently got written up because they're going to be the safest place to be. So we kind of breathed a sigh of relief, like they found this mold before Beth was born and it's going to be all taken care of and we'll just follow through with just dealing with a heart defect. So then at what point did you folks find out that she had aspergillus? Um, she had surgery on November 7th, and I believe it was the 10th or 11th that rumors started going around at the Ronald McDonald House that another case had been confirmed. Um, and it was around the 10th or 11th that I started bringing up, you know, how are we going to test for this? What, what are our options? But I want to say it was approximately three weeks after her surgery that we had the first positive test. What is it about? symptoms or what, what did she um, She didn't actually have a chance to get a really super infection because we started prophylactic antifungals pretty much right away. Um, we discussed pros and, you know, pros and cons and it just made sense that she'd been exposed to go ahead and start the antifungals. So she never really had anything at the time that we could attribute just to aspergillus. There's been several complications but again, it's, it's one of those, what is natural complications for her heart defect versus, you know, having increased inflammatory markers and having to be ventilated. So it's hard to distinguish exactly when the aspergillus infection started affecting her, um, but it certainly has, has changed her trajectory for treatment and um, she's definitely a lot sicker than she was going into the surgery. Can you describe what her state is um, right now? Um, she's currently ventilated. She did have another surgery back on the second to remove some suspect tissue um, and replace her tricuspid valve with a mechanical valve. Um, she's had a difficult time recovering because she went into surgery already compromised. Um, they were able to finally close her chest a couple days ago. It was open in her room for five days. Um, she's having a, a really rough time today. Her markers have come back that she's got another um, infection, whether that's aspergillus or another, well, something's making its presence known. And so she's sick today again. So we're just waiting to get the results of where the current issue is. Do you know how she became infected with aspergillus? So that's a question that I'm not going to have her ask because it's complicated. But she was at Children's Hospital. I'll tell you what the complaint says. She was born and then taken directly to Children's Hospital, where she's lived the whole time, 
except for three days when they thought they were going to discharge her, so she went to Ronald McDonald House. So, but uh, she got it at Children's Hospital, and the type of aspergillus that it looks like is in her heart, and she had open heart surgery. So, draw your conclusions. Okay. Do you want to repeat? Tell us that again. Or do you want their do you want the, their lawyer to say it? Do you, uh, we're both their okay. lawyers. We just we can't hear you, so it's okay. the word. Sorry for playing this let me, game. Let me, let me say it okay. because it's in the context of the complaint and uh, what our allegations are. I want to be very careful here. So, on issues of causation, we are not medical doctors. Um, but I can tell you that she was born, taken by ambulance to Seattle Children's Hospital, where she's lived her entire life except for three days when they thought that she'd be well enough to go home and she was allowed to uh, go to Ronald McDonald House where her parents were living, but then taken back to the hospital. So she's lived there her entire life. She had open heart surgery and she has aspergillus in her heart. So why did you want to uh, get legal representation? What is your hope and goal here? We went into this situation believing that an issue had been found and it was fixed. Um, our daughter has not had an easy road based on a genetic, or it's not a genetic, but a, a congenital heart defect. And this was so unexpected and so unnecessary for her to have this added to it. You know, we will always be wondering, you know, I'm always going to wonder if there were different interventions that could have taken place had the aspergillus not been there. Um, so it just, we have to protect the community. We have to protect friends and family. Now that we're in a community of kids with these kind of defects, we're, we're meeting new parents every day through you know, social media that they just found out their child is going to be born with this defect. And I want to be able to say, take your, ch your children to Children's Hospital. Like doctor, the doctors that have worked on our children, or our daughter, are amazing. And I don't, I don't want people to feel like they can't trust the hospital, but then we trusted them and this happened. So it's kind of... We would not trade the level of care that we have received. Yeah, we would not, we would not trade the level of care that we have received at Children's for anything. I mean, regardless of all of this, um, this is the place, this is where the professionals are that are some of the best in the country. Uh, we love the surgeons, we love the, the nurses, we love the support staff. You know, I mean, it's wonderful. Uh, they've they've done a great job. It's it's the side of it that runs the building is is what we have a problem with. And there, when there's you know almost 20 years of track record, why at the end of the, that 18, 20 years, whatever it is, are we hit by it? Where is who's holding Children's Hospital responsible? It, it, you know, I mean, we felt almost a, a moral obligation to be part of this because um, things have to change. What are you hoping will come out of the lawsuit or your participation in the lawsuit? A change. change. I think it's as simple as that. No one should have to worry about every surgery comes with its own risks of complications. We went into this knowing that our daughter was very sick to begin with. Um, this certainly was not on our radar. So you were saying that you know you heard about this situation, you believe that Children's had resolved the situation, and that's why you felt safe bringing your daughter there. Mm -hmm. After getting this diagnosis that she did have aspergillus, what, I mean, how tough was that to, to reconcile? Um, it was definitely difficult, but we had nurses cry with us when they found out the diagnosis. We've had surgeons that you can just tell on their face. I mean, Beth's first surgery went uh, perfectly, and the surgeon was so proud of his work, and now he was being asked to go back in and take it out to, to clean everything. Um, we still trust the staff 100%. Um, we looked briefly into transferring, but it, it just doesn't make sense. We have the best team in our backyard. We just don't want anyone else to have to go through this. So it sounds like you're separating the people that work there, the surgeons and the nurses, yes. who obviously are some of the best in the country, yes. um, to what the system and the administrative side was doing or lack thereof Correct. in this case. Is that kind of fair? Correct. What you guys are saying? Yeah. 
Um, so when we look at the old cases, I, I know that there was one back in 2001 where somebody got sick, there was a little girl, uh, and it's been so long since then. Um, and there are reports back then of just dead birds and all this debris and the air handling system and all that. And you look at the documents, it's pretty alarming. So um, are you surprised? Like, what, what is the message to the administrative side on, on maybe moving forward, what you guys want to see from Seattle Children's? Don't just change your filters. <laughs> um, scrub your system. But we just, yeah, we want accountability to take the necessary steps to prevent stuff like this. You know, when it first came out last May, that's the first I was aware of a mold problem. It was, oh, okay, they've acknowledged it, they're fixing it. We should be able to trust that the administration is providing a safe environment for the surgeons to do their job in. What has the response from children's been to you guys so far? Um, their um, family relations have been amazing. They've reached out, they've made sure that we're comfortable. We've got Ronald McDonald House taken care of. Um, they're making sure that any extra needs that we have over here that we should be home are taken care of. Um, so they've, they've, been, they've been very supportive. Do you, uh, have you spoken with Dr. Spear, the head of the hospital? We have not. But the, the, you can ask if the hospital has apologized. The hospital apologizes to you. Yes. Hmm. yes How's, how did they do it? Um, they came bedside and basically said it's pretty clear at this point that we're calling this an aspergillus infection. I had a lot of mom guilt about you know timing of surgeries and did I do my proper research? And they assured me that there was, this was out of my control. Um, so that was nice to hear because as a mom, you know. Yeah. <clears throat> How old is your baby now? She's almost five months old. She'll be five months on the 21st. And when do you foresee, you know, maybe her fully recovering, getting out of the hospital, or is that prognosis still um, At this point with how ill she is, she'll probably be in the hospital for at least another six months if we're lucky. That means she's doing well. Um, we still have pathways we can go down to try and, and make her heart as functional as possible. Um, but it's, it's going to be a very long time. Have we given any indication on the aspergillus infection um, and how controlled that is or how squashed that is right now? Um, they take weekly blood tests that test for a part of the mold that, um, that there's, it's a really, all we keep hearing is it's a very difficult infection to get a handle on, to treat, and to find. So it's a week-to-week -week thing, whether it's like, hey, the number went down or went up, but um, she's definitely still happy. How are you keeping so so calm? How are you making sure you you can measure all of this? And um, it's it's a crisis response, I think, at this point. I've gotten so used to talking about her that if I talk about her in a factual way, I can stay pretty put together. If I start talking emotions, um, it's a whole other ballgame. And the other thing is our family and support that we have. Um, big family. <laughs> um, <laughs> And the most important thing is the connection between us, because if we don't, if we're not solid, we can't navigate this. And I mean, and there's so many times when we could have gone off the rails and we didn't. I mean, that's a choice that we make every single day, and um, that's why we can be calm in this. Uh, because it's not always calm. It's behind closed doors, and we both lose it. You know. But yeah, if we focus too much on the emotional side of things, I'm worried about we'll get lost in it. There, she's, Beth is still here. She's still fighting. It's still a day-to-day -day thing, what we're doing as far as medications and treatments. And so if I get caught up on in the scary side of things, I'm worried she's not going to have that advocate there. Is this your first, second child? It's our third. It's your third child. And how has it impacted your life outside of huh. I mean, and obviously, how has it impacted you guys physically and work and all Having to constantly explain to a 10-year-old, the ups and downs, and why that we can't go see our see your sister this weekend, um, but but maybe it'll open up a little bit later, and then something happens. Um, you know, this was not easy for for her. This has not been easy for our two-year-old, whose whose routines have been all disrupted. Um, 
you're living in a, in a communal housing area and, and then going and your norm was to go visit your sister, go to the playroom, go home, take a nap, get up, play with some kids. I mean, it's a whole new life. It's a whole new life and now she's, she's missing going to her, her normal like book babies at the library and playing with her normal group of friends and, and having a schedule where she sleeps in her own big girl bed. She, she was in a crib when she first got here and she's reverted or regressed. And, um, and that's been really hard. Hard. Um, I mean, I like the snuggles now uh, that uh, we pushed our two queen size beds because it's basically a hotel room, a super bed. And now that kid is just jumping all over the place. It's actually fairly easy to get her to go to bed from the very beginning. Um, yeah. Anyways, but it's it's, it's definitely been difficult. Mm -hmm. um, the three nights that Beth was out of the hospital, unfortunately, our ten year old was with her biological mom. And so our 10-year-old has a lot of frustration and anger and hurt that the three days her sister was out of the hospital, she wasn't there. So she's never gotten to spend a night with her sister. I think she's held Beth maybe four times. And this is, this is a big sister who it was meant to be a big sister. So it's, I'd say it's hitting her probably the hardest um, of the two kids. Because at least with a two-and-a-half-year-old, you can kind of distract him a little bit. But yeah, explaining to a 10-year-old that she can't go see her sister because her sister's chest is still open, um, it's pretty hard. And that must be hard for you as a mom not being able to hold your child. Yeah. It's, it's not uncommon for me to go weeks between holding her. As far as Beth's condition, what's your understanding of how her prognosis has changed or has it because of the aspergillus infection? I think that's answer, a, so you kind of answered that uh, at the beginning that it's very difficult to parcel, parcel it out, but it's there, it's complicating things. Um, at the earlier press conference, I kind of explained the process of you have to make decisions of what you treat when because you have the aspergillus and how you treat it, and you alluded to it. I think that that's about all we can expect her to say and not hold her to it. That they have, they, they have to change how they approach the original problem, which was the heart defect. Uh, for example, having a surgery to try to clean out the aspergillus, that would be an example of, you know, that's aspergillus, that's more clear cut, but the other choices I think are way more subtle and, and you need to have a doctor answer that. You two both kind of touched on this, but you, know, you were saying you almost feel a moral obligation to be here. And when you look at this lawsuit, and you look at the pictures of the past families who've lost their kids, to this reason. Um, and then here you are today to, to show that this went on. Uh, when you see the pictures of these past families who lost their kids to Aspergillus, uh, how, I mean, how difficult is it to know that you followed them, that this, they didn't fix this problem, that you still are here today having to deal with this? That might be emotions that I deal with at a later time. Again, it comes down to having been in this situation for almost five months now, there's limited emotional reserves. Um, and that's part of getting the team involved is so they can take care of that side of things. I can just focus on, you know, is Beth having a good day? Yeah. So you folks are from Tacoma, or? We're actually from Lacey. From Lacey. Okay. And then she was born at Tacoma General, you said, right? Yes. Correct. And then immediately went to Georgia. Yeah, I think it was the next, it was the next day. Could you, real quick, go along, do the timeline again of when the surgeries were? Um, so Beth underwent her first surgery called a Norwood procedure on August 26th. Um, it was a very long surgery. Um, she had a delayed recovery just based on, I don't even want to say delayed recovery. There's no set timeline for kids with this heart defect. Um, she got discharged for the three days. We went back into clinic and they noticed that her heart failure had actually increased, so they recommended readmitting her. Um, the team discussed her for a while and decided it was worth an attempt to fix a valve in her heart. And that was the surgery that took place on November 7th, was an attempt to fix her tricuspid valve. Um, unfortunately, the surgery was not successful. Her, her anatomy didn't, didn't allow for that. 
when she was discharged for the three days, it's important to remember, she didn't get to go home. She was discharged for three days to the Ronald McDonald House and then went right back to Children's. She's never been home. The, there are some errors in the complaint, now that I read it, because we had her having the first surgery on the 22nd and nine days at Ronald McDonald House, but it, we'll have to fix that. She had the surgery on the 26th, three days at Ronald McDonald House. So she had two surgeries on Seattle Children's in August, September. And then morning. she had January 2nd also. She she got to use some of the new operating rooms. But then it was on November, the, maybe a couple of days after the November 7th surgery that you found out. Right, I believe it was the 10th was. or the 11th that the aspergillus became known that it was in the operating rooms. Her first positive, I'd have to look at the dates, but it, it might have been end of Jan or end of November. So there's no telling though when she made, she could have gotten in August or correct. November. There's there's no real way of knowing. But did you find out because you asked for the test or because did somebody at Seattle say hey like we have the tester? Um, it took a lot of pushing to get prophylactic antifungals on board because there is the risk to kidney and liver function. So I don't think I think it took till the fourth or fifth positive that they finally said okay this is aspergillus. Um, but she was having elevated numbers for weeks before that they were trying to attribute to other things. Does she need more surgeries? Yes. Do you worry that children still hasn't gotten hold of the problem and that she could be exposed? This may be sound a little, she's already got it. Yeah, yeah. I know that sounds awful to say, but until she's starting to test negative, the surgeries are more important for her to survive than the risk of her getting reinfected. She's already on all of the medications that would hopefully prevent it from, from taking off. At this point, for other parents who need surgeries at Children's, would you recommend that they go? I know it's a great team, but then you know, you do wonder, is, there, is everything under control at this point? I think that's so, it. I would, I would say probably shouldn't ask for okay. that. Okay. Just because they could, you know, that could, oh, be, I see. They could say something. Okay. <laughs> Would you mind saying and spelling your names again, just so that we have it? All of everybody who's spoken. Scott Carnes, C A R N E S S. Scott has two T's. Micah Hutt, M I C A H, Hutt, H U T T. And then my legal first name is Katha, K A T H A, but I go by Katie. Also Hutt. What my name? Karen Karen. And your daughter goes by Beth. Right? She goes by Beth. Yeah. She's named after her grandma who goes by Liz. So, yeah. <laughs> Karen, what's the latest on the, all these cases then? When do you see, I mean, could this go on for months until either of you guys, like, what happens? <laughs> you Good question. Yeah. So, I can tell you what the status of the case is. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, there are a number of individual cases that are filed, and then there's the class action been filed. We have six plaintiffs after the huts are allowed to join, uh, but there are more. We have more cases than that, um, many more, and in the class action. action. So uh, we're hoping that the class action will be approved. If the class action is approved, then everyone would need to be notified uh, that had ever been diagnosed with aspergillus in Seattle Children's, and then they would potentially be able to join the class if they met the criteria that they got the infection there. And, Met a number of other criteria, um, so that's just kind of the status of, of that. The uh, hospital has hired a, a large law firm to defend it. They were going to answer the original complaint, uh, but because I notified them that we were going to file this second complaint, they're going to wait. So they still have not answered it formally. They um, uh, everything seems fine. There will be a lot of motion work in this case. I know that one of the motions that is being uh, contemplated and probably drafted involves uh, whether the protective order that's in the patent note case, the case that was filed by our co counsel, uh, John Lehman, in 2005, uh, if that is going to be able to be voided, if we're going to be able to find a judge that will agree to set that aside so that it can be uh, that material about uh, that was 
discovered back in 2005, uh, if that can be released in our litigation and really honestly to the public, uh, for the public's benefit. That will, that is also, I know, being uh, considered. Um, Brad, I, I can't think of anything else that's, that's really on the horizon. That's pretty much what's going on. There, there, we have issued discovery requests. I will tell you also that we are issuing a subpoena against the Department of Health. Uh, we have asked, we've asked for their records over a, a month ago, or at least back in December, and they told us they couldn't get it to us. I think it was until March sometime. So are you talking about King County? Uh, state. State, okay. Just make sure. And uh, we felt that that was unacceptable to have three months to get us documents, and so uh, we are subpoenaing them. Well, are you doing that because you want to find out what they knew when they knew? There was we want to find out every filings with the Department of Health respect, with respect to Seattle Children's Hospital. Karen, can you talk a little bit about, you know, in the lawsuit it really makes clear that we believe children's kept this a secret and took, made effort to keep Aspergillus and what was going on with that hidden, especially after the Pat Mills case. Um, can you go into that a little bit, that what you're accusing here? Well, we've accused them of a cover-up, uh, and we base that upon many things. Uh, we started off with the... I can't remember if it was November 14th or November 19th when uh, the CEO admitted that there appeared to be a link between what was going on in 2001 to what was going on in 2019, uh, and that they hadn't put the dots together, whatever that meant. That's their job to put the dots together to have a, face, a safe premises. Um, they, in the Pat Note case, in that, th there was so much information raised, and John Lehman said a mountain of information raised that they did not follow up on, uh, that they knew about, they got declarations from their own employees and consultants that they had hired that said, you have a disaster here, what's going on? They didn't address it back then, and here we are. We are here, this last case is like, to me, and I hate the metaphor, like the nail in the coffin of our theory of Look back at the press releases in July when they said, our premises are absolutely safe, um, Aspergillus is super rare, um, everything is back, great business as usual, and here we go again. So that's, we don't, we, we don't back down from, from that. We are, it's very, it's more than disappointing. It's, it's awful to a very serious level. I really admire the Huts for being able to tell you in such good language why they trust the doctors and staff and feel so closely connected and strongly with them. And at the same time, they are not happy with the administration and that building department. But that's, that's to put it lightly for them. They're, they're, they're keeping things together here. And they maybe are more polite than I am, but it's a betrayal of the highest order to have a, a, that garbage going on in such a revered place. So I do, I do uh, think that they're, they are very special, but so are all the other parents. And, and they are here speaking on behalf of not just their child, but all the other parents that are in our litigation. Are there any other questions? If there are and you have any, send them to us and we can get answers for you. If you didn't get the attachment with the photographs, um, let us know. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you.